Welcome to the Net Bible Church YouTube channel. If you haven't done so, please hit the subscribe button and click the bell to be notified of our new uploads. If you'd like more information about the Net Bible Church or how you could donate, please click on the link below. Thank you so much for watching. Hallelujah. God is so good. <clears throat> and um, hallelujah. I'm glad we don't go by feelings because a lot of times you don't have feelings and that those times that you can go by what God said in his word and go by the promises. In my last 40, almost 45, 44 years now of walking with God, I just think about when I first... Um, when I first met the Lord and how glorious it was, how magnificent, <clears throat> how wonderful it was to, to meet Jesus and to walk with Jesus and all the things that I've been through and whether I've been felt like I was a disappointment to God or you know I should or could do better. I knew when God supernaturally was moving through me and through my life. I knew when God was uh, bringing me through some really hard times. And God was pouring himself out of me for some really glorious times. <laughs> Amen. They're all just testimonies of God's goodness. And the fact that God never, ever changes. He's the same. Amen. What he's done for one person, he will he will do for the next if we can just believe, amen, in faith, in God's word and his promise. Hallelujah. <clears throat> you know, we talk a lot about <clears throat> what we call church history and, and things that have transpired in days gone by, even, even the church history that I've experienced since the 70s and um, how in the 70s that was the big charismatic move that was people are coming out of all different denominations and just getting saved and filled the Holy Ghost. And that was pretty much it, just getting saved and filled the Holy Ghost and on fire. And um, so, but a fire doesn't, won't maintain you. You've got to have, you've got to have the instruction of God's word. You've got to have God's word planted. The seed of, <clears throat> the seed of God's word is what changes radically our lives because when <clears throat> when tough times come, it's, we, it's the word that we stand on, the word that's in our heart. And so um, <clears throat> just thinking about all that God has, you know, done in my life, you know, and each one of us can think back upon, you know, when we first got saved and how radical it was. And, <clears throat> and if we haven't had radical times, we can have radical times because we should have radical times in our life. That radical just means it's just a such a change. Um, I've heard many ways of it being explained. And when when you have a, <clears throat> a radical Holy Ghost confrontation with God, you should look different than you did before you had the radical experience with God. It doesn't matter if you were raised in church and Nothing big and special happened. You just always knew Jesus. You accepted Jesus. You maybe prayed in tongues and you've heard the word. But I'm talking about radical times. Everybody, everybody, everybody needs to have radical experiences in the Holy Ghost. Amen. It's those <clears throat> radical changes that, that put the fire in and, and, and kindle the fire and stir up those, those fires in us. Amen. So... You know, I was thinking about, um, you know, when we first, before we first came out here, you know, you've all heard the story and how our life was, you know, we were just going through the motions. You ever feel like you're just going through the motions? Amen. There's times you have to go through the motions and do what is right and, and do the word, whether you feel like it or not. That's why we don't go by feelings. We go by what God's word says. But that doesn't mean that we live a lifetime of, no um, radical experiences in the Holy Ghost and with God. And so um, I think about all the radical experiences I had with God always happened in church. Something always happened in church. 
I had, I had wonderful ex experiences with the Holy Spirit outside of church. You might have heard some of the stories when I was walking to the mailbox on the way home, I, on the way back from the mailbox. I turned around to, to walk back to my apartment when I was living in North Carolina. I turned around and the, the Holy Spirit just came all over me. And I was like, I had no idea why or what was going on, but I just enjoyed it, you know? And those experiences are wonderful. We need to keep our heart open towards God for those things. But I was thinking about when, um, when we first came out here, you know, things were not going good in our life. You know, I was, I was ready to just not give up on God, but give up on, on the direction I was heading after Bible school. And um, <clears throat> so uh, God, at that moment, just at the moment when I was ready to just give up, <laughs> and walk away, the, God sent a, a preacher by the name of Rodney Howard Brown to Rama. And um, I was the director, the camera director, and I was up in the, in the, <clears throat> the, uh, the camera room or the, the, the director's room where all the cameras are and where the desk that I sit at and then I have headphones and I tell what camera to do what shot and stuff. And, um, and so I'm sitting there in the very first service that Rodney w was there, and I'm watching him, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is so God, I need to be in these meetings. And so you've heard the story, I went and got in the meetings, I just said, God, whatever whatever you do, I don't care. I'm giving you this week to just turn me inside out, upside down, slap me up one side and down the other, I don't care if I laugh or cry. It, and, and that's what it was. It, it wasn't, you know, it became known as this laughing revival, and it was not a laughing revival, though there was laughing in that revival. And those are the things we got to keep straight because, um, because we, people began to emphasize one thing, just one thing that the Holy Spirit was doing in people's lives. And let me just say, if you need joy, you need joy. You need the joy of the Holy Ghost, not just laughing at a joke. You need the joy of the Holy Ghost, which is, can't be explained. It, it's not something you can explain. It just comes from up, <laughs> from within you, and all over you. But I spent time crying. I spent time on the floor doing absolutely nothing. I spent time stuck on walls, stuck on floors, stuck on pews, under pews. I felt spent a lot of time doing a lot of things besides laughing. But what happened is everybody became, because people weren't used to seeing people happy in church, <laughs> they weren't used to seeing people laughing and enjoying themselves in church. They just started tagging at the laughing move, the laughing revival, but that's not what it was. It was a move of the Holy Ghost. It was a Holy Ghost revival. It was a Holy Ghost revival. And um, we are in desperate need because at the same time, at the same very time that that revival was coming into the church, the Holy Spirit was moving that way, there were many men that were, were, and let me just say, conspiring on how to have a big church and how to have a big ministry and how to have all the success. And that was not ever how God intended the church to be. It needs to be orchestrated by the Holy Ghost. It has to be about the Holy Ghost. Or, and, and you can say it's, if you look through all of these experiences, there was a book that Rodney wrote called The Touch of God. And um, I, I must have read that book 17, 18 times. Changed my life. Being in those meetings changed my life. He started, after we moved here, then he started coming to California all the time. So we were like, wherever he was, we were going to those meetings. Because how it radically changed us. And what? Because of what transpired in those meetings. It's what transpired in those meetings. And um, you can't just duplicate those things. And, and I, I've, I've learned over the years, you can't try to make something happen. It's got to be genuine. It's got to be God. And so when I started thinking, you know, you know, that was a touch of God. The, the touch of God is just basically, um, you know, the touch and the anointing and the presence of God where you feel it. It's a tangible thing. And of course, in this church, it could be a regular thing, you know, during worship. 
but we we want what God wants to do in this last hour, in these last days, in the outpouring. So I can look back, you know, I can look back when I first got, first got saved, you know, God touched me. He's touched me so many times in so many ways. And I needed to be, I, ne I needed a radical touch of God. Amen. Sometimes it's just a, you know, a little, a little prompting. You know, you think about a child as you're teaching them, you know, sometimes you got to pick them up and you got to hold their hand and walk with them. And then you got to let them go and they got to walk on their own. But our father's always there to catch us. He's always there to teach us. He's always there to guide us by the Holy Ghost that lives in us. And so, um, you know, I've been thinking about, you know, the touch of God and the outpouring of God and, you know, just on my own personal lives and, and on your lives. I, I, I would be so <laughs> remiss and saddened if the people that come to this church don't experience a radical change of God. I'm not talking about, oh, that service is great. We sense the presence of God. And it was, I'm talking about you can't get out the door. And you're not thinking about where you're going to eat. You're just thinking about you just want to get alone with God. You're just thinking about I just want to get in another service like that. You're, I just want to be in the presence of God. I don't care what's going on in my life. I don't care about, I don't care about my life and all the details and, and what's going on in the world and what's going on in the news. I just want to be in the presence of God a hunger, you know, and I think about, you know, um, just such a mighty radical move of God and, and that radically changes our lives. It's got to happen. It can't be just coming to church and feeling good, which is wonderful, but it's got to be way more than that. It's got to be radically changing where, where Lauren's running up and down the aisles <laughs> and, and, and Aaron can't wait to go find somebody that needs to have the hands laid on him so they can be healed and raised up. Amen. And Nicole's just talking to everybody she comes in contact with. Do you know Jesus? You got to get saved. I'm talking about radically changing us. Like Ryan, uh, Rodney Howard Brown used to call it a Mack truck experience. He says, when you have a Mack truck experience, if you got hit by a Mack truck, and they peeled you off of the grill, you would look different than you did before. And so it's not the matter of just being in church and looking the same way and doing the same things and the same thing over and over and over and over again. It's got to be more than that. Amen? You have to have a radical experience. You have to have a Mack truck experience with God so that when you, when you get hit by God, you don't look the same. You don't look the same. Your friends say, what happened to you? I've had many times in my lives where, you know, I, I was at PTL, and then when I went back and I found Pastor Redcoat, Gerald Watson, and, you know, um, it, everything was the word, 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 the word. And then I went back to see my friends at, at, in Charlotte, and, you know, I'll stand around all my Christian, spirit-filled friends, tongue-talking, you know, like all of us, and they started you know, we're talking about something, they said something, and I was like, well, that's not in the Bible, that's not scriptural. And they all looked at me like, what happened to you? And I had a Mack truck experience with the Bible. Bam! And everything was the Bible after that. Everything was the Word, the Word, the Word, the Word. And so I looked different to them. Like, what happened to you? What happened? People should be saying to us, what happened to you? You know, and you're, I'm glad you asked. I had a Mack truck experience with the Holy Ghost. And I'm not the same as I used to be. And I can never go back. And we keep, we should keep having these experiences. Amen. And so you wonder, well, I want it. You know, how do you get this? Let's, let's first look at James chapter four. James chapter four in verse eight says, come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And that's out of the NIV. In the Amplified, it says, come close to God with a contrite heart, and he will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your unfaithful hearts. You double-minded people, be miserable and grieve and weep over your sin. Let your foolish laughter be turned into mourning and your reckless joy to gloom. Humble yourselves with the attitude of repentance and insignificance 
in the presence of Lord. And he will exalt you. He will lift you up and he will give you purpose. Amen. Sometimes, um, sometimes we, we get attitudes. <laughs> we can get attitudes so easy. We can get attitudes about other people. We can get attitudes about how we're better Christians. Or we can get attitudes of look down upon people. And look, get attitudes of like, ah, oh, this stuff doesn't work. We get so many negative attitudes that are not of God that will keep us out of this, this place that God has for us. But he says to us, he says, come near to him. That means we have to come near to him and then he will come near to us. Brother Hagin said that the last great move of God is going to happen in the church. Not out of the church. The move of God is going to radically happen in the church. And in order to be a part of it, you got to be in the church. Amen? Amen. Now, of course, the church will take it to people, but I'm not talking about the church is going to take it to those people that are not saved, not to Christians that are lukewarm and don't want anything to do with it. If you're a born-again Christian, you need to start calling on God and asking God to help you to, to, so that you could be stirred up. Coming to God, coming near to God. We need to come near to him. He said if we come to him... He will come near to us. Amen. And, and let me just say, I've, I've, I've pondered this. I've, I've even just praying, praying for my family, praying for people that are, that are, you know, call themselves Christians, but, you know, there's no conviction of anything. They still party the way they always did. They live the always did. They talk the way they did. They curse. They just do all these kinds of things. And I'm not trying to get religious because I know everybody has a walk. When you come to God, there's changes. But I'm talking about just labeling yourself. There's a, you, you, you all know people that call themselves Christians. They've never had a born-again experience. They're not on fire for God. They're not, they're not. I'm, talking about, I'm talking about radical Christians that come to church and get radically changed, and they go out to a lost and dying world, not a lukewarm Christian world. We're going out to a lost and dying world. So God wants us to know that he's not withholding anything from us. But, but we're withholding from him. We're withholding our lives. He said, come to me. And so, um, and then, then I was thinking about the whole church thing. See, we come to church like even what we have. When we come here, we expect something and we get what we expect, whether it's little or much. We come to God we're coming, we're coming to church, and when we're here, he touches us. Amen? And so um, uh, there's just something about, you know, because I find myself praying, you know, for revival, thinking, oh, it's just going to happen in a household, and, you know, then these people are going to tell this, but that's not how it's going to, it's going to happen in my sister's house, and then she's going to take it to my brother's house, and my brother's going to take it to my brother. You know, like all this revival, but that's not how it's going to happen. The revival is going to happen in the church, and the church is going to take it to the world for those who will believe. Amen? And, the, and then let me just say, when they get the Lord, they're going to have to come to church. It's not about, well, you know, I don't really feel like it. I got stuff I got to do on Sundays, and, you know, it's my only day to sleep in. A lot of people say it's my only day to sleep in. You work six days a week. You need to, you need to get off one day. Sleep in any other day. Sleep in one day a week and go late to work. <laughs> people like they give their lives to their job and they wouldn't be late. They're going to be there on time. They're going to do everything right with their job. But we can't go to church for a couple hours. What happens when God starts moving and services start going three hours? Let me just say, church services might have to go three hours before God, you know, we come and we wait on God, and then he's just getting ready to move, and we are dismissing. And, 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 and I'll, let me just say, I know as a minister of the gospel, <laughs> as a preacher, you get those still small voices in your head saying, oh, the people are tired. They don't want to listen. They want to go. They're thinking about lunch. They're 
wanting to call a friend, they're on their phones, they're not paying attention. <laughs> you know, all of these things, and I'm like, I'm continually telling myself, if I ever do anything because I feel pressure, even in my, I'm not saying from anybody, but in my own thinking, that I'm getting pressure to do it this way or that way, I am going to go ahead and, I'm going to go ahead and do that. <laughs> I'm going to do the opposite of what, what my thoughts are, what people are not going to like. Because that's the problem that preachers have all the time. They're not going to like this. They're not going to like that. They're, you know, they're going to be upset about this and upset about that. <laughs> and you have to fight those thoughts all the time. Well, then, then I tell myself, well, they're not going to have to be upset then. <laughs> It's not between me and them. It's between them and God. <laughs> it's not my problem. People want to be upset? Go to God with your little tantrum. <laughs> this is what this is. So many problems with the church. We want to touch a God. We're just going to have to. We're going to have to buckle up and and submit. That that is exactly what it was saying there. Everything. Be miserable and grieve and weep over your sin. Let your foolish laughter be turned to mourning and your reckless joy to gloom. Humble yourself. So we just have to have an attitude. God, I want a radical experience with you. I want more. I want a touch. Let me just say, we got the Holy Ghost. But you're not going to have a revival on your own. <laughs> a lot of times people are, well, you can't ask. I've heard preachers. You know, I hate when people say more, they want more of God. Well, come on. We know what people are talking about. I want, I want a more, a deeper experience. I want more understanding. People hate, you know, I've, I've heard preachers come against the word more. Oh, you know, more, you got God. <clears throat> yeah, really. You need more revelation. <laughs> because we can have more. God, the, the word says that God is more than enough. So we need more than enough if we need God. Amen? And so they're like, we don't ever sing songs that have the word more in it. I'm like, well, you're going to rip those pages out of the Bible? God is more, much more. And if we want God, we need more. Amen? We need, we need more revelation, more understanding. We need a fresh touch from heaven. Amen? And let me just say, God is so willing. He's so willing and, and we just got to believe God for a fresh touch. Amen? A fresh touch from heaven. And, and I love it because he said, you just come to me, draw near to me, and I will absolutely draw near to you. Amen? You know, we can't expect to, you know, be driving our car around. And let me just say, I've had touch of God in my car. I've had touch of, of God just, you know, sitting on my couch. I've had touch of, but I'm, tell, I'm talking about Matt. Um, I was going to say MacBook, a Mac truck. <laughs> We've all had too many MacBook experiences. We need a Mac truck experience where, where things radically change. It's, and I was tall, talking to Rev G about this. I said, I've been in some radical, radical, radical moves of God, but they always were in the church. They weren't out on the streets. <laughs> they were all in the church. Hallelujah. Uh, John, I'm going to just read this. John 7, 37 says, On the last and greatest, John 7, 37, On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water flow from within them. So you say, you come to drink, and you drink so much that that it just overflows. You ever pour something in a glass and you pour too much? You ever pour something in a glass and you poured a little too much? It overflows, and that's what God's talking about. That he wants us to come to him, and, and he will give us something to drink. He will fill our cup, and he will fill it to overflowing. Amen? Rivers that will of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the spirit. Spirit. In other words, when we come to Jesus for something to drink, he, it is not a one-time experience. It's not a one-time experience. Amen. Not a one-time experience. 
I'm going to read something in um, Matthew. Hallelujah. In Matthew, and uh, let me see, chapter, chapter 9, Matthew 9, and I'm going to start in verse um, 18. While he's saying this, the synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died. Come and put your hand on her, and she will live. Now, I like this one thing because he understood the power of laying on of hands. So he came to Jesus, and he had faith that Jesus could lay hands on her, and she would live. And Jesus got up and went with him, and so did the disciples. Just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. And she said to herself, she said, she said, if I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. And Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter. He said, your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at the very moment. And, and, and so if you look at this, she just said, these, these are two people with faith. One of them said, come lay your hands on my daughter and she will be healed. And so Jesus went. Now remember the centurion said, don't even come to my house. Just say the word. And remember, Jesus said he had more faith than all the other people because he understood the power of the word. Amen. But Jesus had mercy. He'll still lay hands on people and heal them, touch them. But this woman, she didn't even need a word. She didn't need for him to come and lay hands on her. She said, I'm going to come and get what I need. Because if I, I could just touch him, if I could just touch him. I remember what Jesus said in that same story. He said, who touched me? He said, who touched me? Because I felt power go from me. Remember the story. He said, who touched me because I felt power go out of me. So in other words, you can touch God and power will flow from him. Amen? And you're like, well, you know, we think, okay, if we could just be at the throne of God or if Jesus was here and I could touch him. Let me just say, God is everywhere all the time. And he said, Come to him with our hearts. Touch him with our heart. Take your heart and touch God with your heart. Amen? Because sometimes people, you know, we go to God in prayer and our hearts are cold and indifferent. And nothing happens. God says, come to me with your heart. Come to me with your heart and soul. Come to me with everything that you are and everything you have. Come and touch me. Like the woman with the issue of blood. She came and she touched Jesus with faith. And when she did, Jesus, not even realizing who it was, knew that somebody touched him because power went out from him. We can touch God in such a way that the power of God will overtake us. Amen? Amen? You've got to get excited about this or you're going to be sitting around the sidelines side watching other people running and being on fire. Let me just say this happens in every single revival. There are always people sitting on the sidelines and they're watching it happen for other people, mocking and making fun. But we don't want to be that. We want to be the ones running and shouting and having a Mack truck experience, right? I'm going to read another story. These stories help us. Amen. Blessed are those that hear the reading of the word. This is in um, the book of Acts chapter 10. And starting with verse 1, it says, At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion. That means he wasn't a Jew. He was a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He was an Italian centurion. But he had enough sense to pray. <laughs> he and his family were devout and God-fearing. Think of this. Centurions, Italians, 
They weren't Jews. They didn't have any scriptures. They didn't have anything, but they loved God. They were devout, God-fearing. God, let me just say, they were devout in God. They reverenced God. They reverenced the things of God. And in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius, <laughs> he knew his name. God knows your name, Nicole. <laughs> God knows your name. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord, he asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial of offering before God. Now send men to Joppa and bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, who's, I don't think he was like a tanner like out in the sun tanner. I think he was a tanner. He worked with leather tanner. <laughs> Because I was Debbie the Tanner at one time, but I, the only leather I had was I was wearing on my shoes or carrying a strap on my shoulder. <laughs> so when the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and, servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. So he's like, immediately he's taking care of business. We need to go to Joppa and get Peter. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the rooftop to pray, and he became hungry and wanted something to eat. You ever be hungry when you're praying? <laughs> oh, you're just like Peter. <laughs> and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to the earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, now you have to understand, these were animals that were considered with the, to the Jews as unclean. You don't touch these animals. You don't eat these animals. Amen. That means you don't eat pig. That means there was a pig on there. He saw some bacon on that thing. <laughs> That sheet was being lowered down. He saw him a pork chop, barbecue ribs. And so it contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. <laughs> Let me just say, God has a strange way of getting messages across in visions and in dreams. <clears throat> and this is a vision he had. It fell into a trance. A lot of times, you know, we'll come and we'll, you know, how we come and we pray together and afterwards we'll say, did anybody get anything in prayer? Because <clears throat> sometimes you'll just pray and just pray. Sometimes all of a sudden you'll be praying and all of a sudden you just kind of see something. Sometimes you just get a word and you understand what the word means. And so, in other words, he was just praying and he fell into a chant, trance. In other words, as he was praying, he all of a sudden he saw this vision. And this all happening while he was praying. So, so y'all, if you've ever, you fell in trances before in prayer, you just see something and maybe God will explain something. So he said, surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. I have never had barbecue ribs. The voice spoke to him the second time, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times. <clears throat> Sometimes it takes more than once for God to get his message across to us. So he must have been having a Groundhog Day experience because this happened and he was arguing with God. No, I can't eat that. And God says, yes, take, kill, eat. And then he, all of a sudden it happened again. The sheet got lowered and he saw it again. The same, the same vision that he had happened three times because God was trying to get his attention. Amen. Hallelujah. And three times immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, hmm, what was that all about? <laughs> the men sent from Cornelius found out where, where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up. 
go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guest. The day Peter, the next day Peter started out with them, and some of uh, some of the believers from believers from Joppa went along. The following day he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and his close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for the Jew to associate with, with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, three days ago I was in my house praying. At this hour, three in the afternoon. Here we are, three in the afternoon again. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayers and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. <laughs> Could be a song. Lives by the sea. So I went for the I went for you um, so I sent for you immediately and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell. Then Peter began speaking. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. That is good news. I'm going to read that again because it doesn't look like everybody's hearing it. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right and does what is right and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee from the baptism of John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with them. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on the cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. And all of the prophets testify from him and everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking, these were, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. And then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Hallelujah. 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 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Think of back in that day, Cornelius, a God-fearing man, called Peter to come and preach the message of salvation. And as we can see, it's a very, very short message. But when he preached that message, the Holy Ghost fell. Hallelujah. Let me just say, why? Because they were reverent. They reverenced the things of God. And they prayed to God. Though they were not Jews, they prayed to God. And God saw their hearts, their reverence, their openness of heart. And he sent somebody to preach the gospel to them. And when he preached the message, in a couple short paragraphs, the Holy Spirit fell on all of them and they began to speak in other tongues as the Holy Ghost had given them the utterance. Hallelujah. What separates the girls from the women and the boys from the men? A reverent heart. Cornelius was a reverent man. He reverenced the things of God. How reverent have the children of the living God become? Or what lack of reverence do we have for the things of God? We have to have reverence for the things of God. We have to have reverence for the word of God. We have to have reverence for the Holy Ghost. We have to have reverence for church. We have to have reverence for the preaching of the word. We have to have reverence. When we come to God, we can't come cold and indifferent. We have to come with reverence. The church has got to have a great awakening, but it will not happen for those that do not have reverence. We have to reverence the things of God. We saw what happened to Uzziah. Or Yusa. We saw what happened to Yusa when he touched the things of God. He touched the things of God. He touched the ark of God. We saw what happened to him when he touched the things of God with irreverence. He died. Hallelujah. When we have organizations called churches that have tried to touch the things of God, tried to make organizations that, reverence, that re resemble God, it was a form of godliness, but they denied the very power. They denied the Holy Ghost. They denied speaking about the blood. They denied speaking about the name. They denied God himself, and they denied the power. They had a form of a church. It looked like a church, but it didn't have any of the power. And God never goes where he's not invited. He doesn't show up where he's not asked. He said, if you come to me, I will come near to you. But we can't just come the way we want to and the way we feel. We got to come the way he asks us to. We have to come with reverence for the things of God. We have to have reverence. We have to ask ourselves, how much reverence? I'm, I'm going to say, well, we marked off a little time on our calendar and came to church or marked off a little time. No, I'm talking about how much reverence do we have for the things of God. There has to be reverence. Amen. It's not that we are done with the era of what God can do for me. The church have become nothing but how we have in society spoiled, rotten brats that demand their way. That is in, has got in. See, what happened is when they started all these organizations without the Holy Ghost, then it, it seeped, all that attitude seeped in the church. It seeped into all kinds of churches. It seeped into Pentecostal, Holy Ghost, Word churches. That attitude of they'll just sit on the floor and kick and scream until they get their way. And so every preacher starts succumbing to that attitude and succumbing to that, that uh, 
that, that attitude of, you know, you know, it's got to be my way or I'm leaving. Leave, leave, leave. I've, I've determined, I've determined if I'm the only one standing here, I will keep on doing what God has called me to do because I do not, I am not going to allow bad attitudes or irreverence of the things of God because you're walking dead men. Irreverent, handling the things of God and misappropriating because we have to look at ourselves. If Jesus is our Lord, if Jesus is our Lord, we are the temple of the living God. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And if we are the temple of the Holy Ghost, we above all people should reverence the things of God. Cornelius was not a Christian. He wasn't a Jew. But he reverenced the things of God. And because he reverenced the things of God, an angel appeared to him, and that angel gave him a message, and then they brought somebody in to preach the gospel. And as he was speaking the word, the Holy Ghost fell because he found a place of reverence. The Holy Ghost will fall on you laying in your bed if you have a heart of reverence. The Holy Ghost will fall on you when you're driving your car if you have a heart of reverence. to know your way, your way, not our way. Oh, Father, forgive us for being selfish. Forgive us for being, forgive us for being demanding of our own way. and contrite 